I'm gonna start. How's it going? Hey, hey. How you I'm gonna start with 222 and then we'll go to 59. Hi, thanks. Hey, thanks a take lot. Take a mic, please. Thanks. Congratulations. A uh, question from Bulgaria. Uh, could you tell us more about the process, how you embody the character, how you started working on that role? Oh, it's so boring. But if you want to hear it, I can tell you the whole. You know, it's like a big uh, souffle or a stew. You just, you know, you throw some potatoes and some carrots in there. And it's kind of, you work with uh, uh, amazing uh, dialect coach like Liz Himmelstein, who worked with Gary Oldman and Margot and Terry Knickerbocker, my acting coach. And um, I did some ride-alongs with some cops, um, Josh M McMullen in Southern Missouri. Uh, Liz Himmelstein taped two cops, actually. There was a guy named Deemer in LA. I did a ride along with him, and I met with a skin graft doctor who introduced me to some burn victims, actually. I mean, I, but the thing is, that's if you have luxury, the, the luxury of time, you know, which you don't always have for a part. And, um, and, and then I worked with Martin, and, but sometimes you get a part and you only have a week or, or a couple days to prepare. I heard that Jeremy Renner only had four days to prepare to play uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, which is a lot if you're playing Jeffrey Dahmer, you know? So I had the advantage that I had like two or three months. And so I got to indulge in all this research. And so it was a lot of fun. So that's, that's a long answer to your short question. We're gonna go to 59 and then 134. Uh, Matt Fager, home, RogerEbert.com. Hey. You said a wonderful thing about the arc of your character being Barney Fife going into Travis Yes, Bickle. yes. I'd love to ask, in any way, was, Trav was uh, Barney Fife and the great Don Knotts any inspiration to you as an actor throughout your career? Absolutely. I mean, I, I mean that when I say uh, Barney Fife. And, you know, the town of Ebbing is very much like Mayberry, and Woody Harrelson's character is very much like the Andy Griffith character. And, in fact, I could be wrong about this. Check your facts. But I think we shot in Silva, North Carolina. And I'm, I think Mayberry was shot there, but I could be wrong about that. But, you know, the, the goofiness of Barney Fife, the, the, the kind of hapless thing of, of Barney Fife, and then his transition into, into somebody else was just sort of, Travis Bickle was kind of a, it, Barney Fife to Travis Bickle was kind of a generalization, but um, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that, that obviously, but, you know, yeah. We're going over to 134 and then 16 in the back. Hey, Sam, over here. Um, other side. Hey. Oh. There you go. To your left in right the here. back. Okay. Hey, so hey. you dedicated your win to Phil Hoffman, and I would just Oh, you caught that. I, good. We could you hear got, it. We you, could hear you heard that? Yes. Because I thought the music was going. Yep. Oh, good. I'm glad you heard that. Good. So, so I'm curious, like, as, as a friend and as a colleague, tell, tell me, you know, what he meant to you, how he inspired you. Well... I guess you want to start making me cry, but he's, yeah, he was an old friend of mine and he directed me in a play at the public theater and uh, um, yeah, he was very close to me and he was an inspiration to all of my peers, you know, people like Jeffrey Wright, Billy Crudup, Liev Schreiber, you know, um, you know, everybody, in my, Mark Ruffalo, Josh Brolin, I mean, whoever was in my age range, Phil Hoffman was the guy and he was a great director, and he believed in, in doing theater. In fact, he, was, he vowed to do a play a year, which I don't know if he, he got to do, but because he was very busy doing movies. But he was a great inspiration and a, and a great theater director. And I don't know if anybody knows, he was, he was a bit of a jock. He was a wrestler, and he played basketball, and um, he inspired me. And I could go on for an hour about Phil Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman was a good friend, and he was a huge, huge ins inspiration on me. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to 16, then we'll come to 198. Somewhere in the back. To your in the back, right. To your right. To okay. your right. Okay. Nice. okay. Hey, Ian hey, Winter for Latin America. How are you doing? You know, I, I stopped counting at 21 the awards that you won before the Academy Awards. So did you count them at all? I'm sorry. And, can we, say, say one more time. I, I stopped counting at 21 <laughs> yeah. the awards that you won. <laughs> so did you count them at all? And <laughs> no, did you feel that those were like billboards saying, Sam, you're going to win the Oscars now? <laughs> no, but that sounds like a really cool dream. But no, no. 
We're going over to 198, and then I'm going to have to wrap it up to 211. Hey, what's up, Sam? Hey, what's going? up, man? Uh, Stephen Byrne from Orthy 2 fm hey, Ireland. Man. Obviously very... I like your hair, dude. Ah, thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Obviously very proud of Martin because uh, we hail from Ireland. So, uh, and Saoirse. And Saoirse as well. Cartoon Salute tonight. Colin and in Bruges, yeah. Loads, exactly. As a frequent collaborator, obviously, now of Martin, what is it about him that makes him such a great artist? Well, you know, he, he says, Martin says that, you know, you couldn't set this in Ireland or England or... But I actually think you could set this movie in almost any working class town and over, all over the world, but I... He disagrees with that, but I, I think you could, it could be anywhere almost. But, I, but there is obviously something very timely about it now, what's going on in this country, you know. Yeah. And we're gonna wrap it up right here with 211. Hi, James Blue. Hey, how you doing? PBS NewsHour. Hey. Uh, there's been some complaint, criticism about the film. Yes. Uh, specifically as it relates to African portrayal and the relationships of African Americans. Can yes. You talk about specifically your character and whether you take that criticism on, or sorry, how you dealt with it, and your sense of that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated issue, but I mean, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar wrote an article that was really amazing, um, sort of defending the movie, and as far as that goes, and it was really eloquent. I didn't realize he's like, he's like a cultural professor, which I didn't know, in, in, in addition to being like a basketball icon. And that was a great article that articulated everything and I think for me, you know, the whole thing is that, you know, they have a lot of work to do, the, uh, Mildred and Dixon. It's not like they're, like, all of a sudden redeemed at the end of the movie. They, they have, you know, a lot of work to do. Maybe some therapy, you know. It's, it's, it's an ongoing thing, you know. So, and it's also, it's a, it's a, it's a movie, and it's a, it's a dark fairy tale of some sorts. And so it's like, it's, it's not necessarily, in real life, we probably would have gone to prison, both of our characters. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how I, I see it. Thank you so much and congratulations. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you.